Good morning, everyone. We'll be begin shortly. Give some people time to get into the room. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Health Talks, the speaker series of Arizona State University's College of Health Solutions that aims to inspire collaboration and conversation on important topics in health. My name is Marcus Jones, and I'm the Assistant Director for Special Projects and Events at the college, and I'll be serving as your moderator this morning. As a reminder, we ask you to put all questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of, at the, end of the discussion. This meeting is also being recorded and will be pu published on the college's YouTube page. Today's topic is COVID-19. What does the science say about reopening? We have three fantastic panelists from across Arizona State University that shows how it takes an interdisciplinary effort to address today's challenges. Um, on our panel, we have Megan Jen, an associate professor of epidemiology and a member of the global health faculty in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. She also holds affiliate appointments in the Global Institute for Sustainability and the ASU Decision Theater. Also joining us are Heather Ross, a clinical assistant professor and a policy fellow of the office of Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego. She holds an appointment between the School of for the Future of Innovation Society and the Edson College of Nursing and Health Innovation. And also joining us is Michael Schaefer, a professor of social work in the Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions, where he holds an affiliate appointment in the Center for Health Information Research and the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Thank you all for joining us. Megan, I'll let you take it away. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to participate today. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick overview of the epidemiology of COVID, what the latest evidence is saying, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Heather Ross to discuss some policy considerations. Uh, and then finally, Michael Schaefer will finish up the webinar today with an overview of the statewide contact tracing effort. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Awesome. So uh, every morning I wake up, I make a cup of coffee, and I check the ADHS COVID dashboard. Um, so as of today, we have over 10,000 cases, uh, 517 deaths, and over 100,000 PCR tests. Uh, as of yesterday, this testing capacity was the lowest in the country. Um, so I'll have to see with the, the new data that got added today, whether we're still at the bottom of the pack or not. I'm hopeful with the testing blitz that these numbers are gonna come up a little bit. Um, it's also important to note that the data that we're seeing right now represents what happened probably about two weeks ago in the state. There's a lag with the incubation period and, and reporting delays. So if you look at the graph on the left side of the screen, you can see a heat map of cases by zip codes around the state. Um, and there are a few areas of concern that are showing up in Arizona. One is the detention center in Eloy, south and then the other is the area around Navajo Nation. Most of Navajo Nation up there on the top right is uh, gray because Arizona is not showing data in areas where tribal, tribal residents make up 50% of the population. Next slide please. If we look at the rate of new cases, the pace of growth has slowed considerably in Arizona, suggesting that our social distancing measures are clearly working. Uh, we are still seeing a modest case growth, or are not just slightly above one, so still an increase in cases, and we still expect the peak daily case count projected to be sometime in the future. Next slide. So hospitalization data gives us a good idea of where we are in the outbreak because hospitalizations are not dependent on the availability of testing. 
the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations has leveled off, possibly even started to decline in the state, and we're clearly well below our hospital capacity, which is great. Um, so staying at home is always meant to be a temporary measure to prevent the healthcare system from being overwhelmed and to put in place capacities to enable case-based disease management. Next slide, please. So one of the main gating criteria for reopening as a state is to see a decline in the percentage of positive tests as a result of all tests. And so as testing increases to meet the demands of the population in our state, we should see an increase in the number of tests and a decrease in the percentage of all the tests that come back positive. So um, you can see the dotted line there is the um, seven day average of the percentage of positive tests. We've been kind of holding steady for the last couple days. We had been increasing, but now we're holding steady at around six to 7%. So we want to see that percent positive um, rate start to turn and decline for 14 straight days. Okay, next slide. Um, so this figure is from the Navajo uh, National Epidemiology Center. And I mentioned that Navajo Nation is a area of special concern in Arizona. So after New York and New Jersey, uh, it's the highest infection rate in the country. There are over 2,600 cases and 85 deaths just in Navajo Nation. And before COVID, this community was already extremely vulnerable with a high prevalence of underlying disease, a lack of public health infrastructure, and limited access to uh, care and supplies. And Native uh, communities tend to be somewhat invisible in terms of their health inequities. And so I think it's really critically important that we devote you know, as much uh, money and resources as we can diverted to this community. Next. So um, it's probably no surprise to most of you that COVID-19 has unmasked longstanding racial and ethnic related disparities that often result from socioeconomic and environmental factors. In public health emergencies, these conditions can isolate people from the resources that they need to prepare for and respond to an outbreak. So in Arizona, um, although native uh, populations make up 4% of the total population, right now they're accounting for 21% of our total cases 12% of our hospitalizations, and 22% of our COVID deaths. So um, this is extremely concerning in terms of disparities in the state. So what do we know about uh, risk factors for COVID? We know that people with underlying health conditions, such as the 40% of Americans who live with diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and other chronic diseases, are more vulnerable to COVID. Um, we also know that the risk of death from COVID increases with age. If you put these two together, uh, people who are 65 or older, or those who have at least one chronic health condition make up 73% of those who have been hospitalized and 97% of all deaths from COVID. So supporting those who are at highest risk of severe disease is essential so that they can stay home and stay away from others. Next. So uh, this is a particular area of interest for, um, for me, the role of children and transmission. So this is a really active area of research and discussion. And um, this is one area where the science is definitely not settled. I know that all of the parents out there, um, myself included, desperately, desperately want those kids to go back to school. Um, and we tend to think of kids as super spreaders for respiratory viruses and uh, rightfully so. But there's some interesting data um, suggesting that SARS-CoV-2 may very well be different than other respiratory um, viruses. So first, kids have an overall lower incidence of disease than adults, we know that. Um, they also seem to have a lower risk of infection given exposure, so that's really important. Um, third, less than 10% of cluster studies show a pediatric index case which suggests to me that kids are um, unlikely to be driving household transmission. Um, on the flip side, there have been some modern studies in China that show that the school closures were effective. They reduced peak incidence by 40 to 60%. Um, and we do know that kids have antibodies, so they're clearly getting mild or asymptomatic infections. But if we take all of this data together, 
I would say there's some evidence suggesting that there's not as much transmission um, coming from kids. So some of the reasons why uh, the data has been slow to come in on this topic is because one, schools are closed, kids are cocooned with their families, so it's hard to study with, it's hard to study them. Um, also, we haven't done a lot of testing in kids because we've had uh, virus tests in short supply and they've been primarily reserved for frontline workers or those in the hospitals. And so they haven't been going to kids. Um, so what we really need are sort of more uh, surveillance studies in kids, more cluster studies. Um, and we need to figure out how to catch these transmission events in real time, which is really, really difficult research to do and it involves a bit of luck. But um, so science is still out on the role of kids in transmission. Next. Okay, so thinking about where COVID is spreading um, the fastest gives us some clues about disease transmission. And I don't think we should think of super spreaders as people um, as much as events, places, and occupations. So if we look at where the largest super clusters are occurring in our country, they're in places like meatpacking plants, nursing homes, reservations, prisons, and detention centers, um, and essential workers like the Walmart cluster. So uh, what do these areas have in common? Well, there are people who live or work in crowded conditions. They can't stay home. Uh, they have little say in how they do their work and no sick leave. And they tend to be economically and socially disadvantaged. So there seems to be a real toxic mix of racial, financial, and dis dis excuse me, geographic disadvantage that's driving COVID incidence and mortality. There's a great article um, by James Hamblin in The Atlantic recently, and he said, we do not have vulnerable populations as much as we have vulnerabilities as a population. And this really stuck with me, sort of thinking about how we manage the health of our populations and our collective well-being. And moving forward, if we don't have strategies that protect everyone from infection, um, then everyone will be at risk. Next. Okay, what do we know about uh, SARS-CoV-2 disease transmission. Uh, we know that it's very infectious. We know that the r naught is probably somewhere between two and three. Uh, we also have data suggests that there's a significant amount of asymptomatic and presymptomatic uh, disease transmission. And this is really important for some of our modeling work. If we look at the serial interval for COVID, and that's the time between a primary case getting symptoms and a secondary case getting symptoms. Um, that's about four days. Um, and it's shorter than the median incubation period for COVID, which is about five days. And so from an infectious disease standpoint, anytime you have an, a serial interval that's close or shorter than a median incubation period, that means that pre-symptomatic transmission is likely playing an important role in the outbreak. Um, and so just isolating cases is not going to be as effective as we would like it to be. Um, we also have modeling data that supports this claim of presymptomatic transmission, uh, which su suggests that the spread and extent of SARS-CoV-2 infections around the world um, couldn't be accounted for solely by transmission from symptomatic in individuals. Um, the short serial interval also has really important implications for contact tracing, which we'll get to later. This means that we probably only have about a 48-hour window after an index case develops symptoms before, uh, in order to isolate and um, test and alert contacts of that case, sorry. So that's a very short timeline that re requires a really aggressive public health approach. Next. So this is a widely uh, cited paper from Science um, as evidence for the presymptomatic transmission rate. And you can see that the red dotted curve is the incubation period and the, uh, the light gray curve is the serial interval. And you can see how much they overlap. And on the right, um, in this study, they estimated that 44% of all transmission events occur pre-symptomatically. And most of these occur between zero and two days before symptom onset. We also know that people can have a long trailing positive PCR test, up to 28 days. So you can test positive for um, uh, COVID for many, many days after your infection is cleared. 
and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're still infectious. So this also has some important implications for public health. So as we're getting to the point of uh, reopening our country, it's very important to understand how many people in any given community have had COVID, even if they were unaware that they were infected. So antibody or serological tests um, give us some of this evidence. They're, they show a body's reaction to an infection, suggesting that you may have had COVID in the past. So results of big community sero studies or big antibody studies um, can help policymakers gauge how vulnerable communities are to the virus and how frequently asymptomatic and mild cases occur. So reports from the first zero studies uh, around the world have started to trickle in. And you can see from this table here that most of them are in the single digits in areas that haven't been hit too hard. Um, areas that have been hit a bit harder like New York are showing higher uh, rates of zero prevalence, which would make sense. Um, and there are a couple other things that I just want to mention about these zero studies. And, you know, although they give a snapshot of a uh, community at a specific point in time, um, many of these have some, I, I have some concern about the sampling methodology of many of these. They've been kind of rushed quickly to publication. Uh, we also have sort of a market that's been flooded with antibody tests. I think there are over 150 antibody tests on the market right now. Most of them are not FDA approved. They have variable levels of um, accuracy, which impact the results that you're going to see from those zero studies. Um, but you know, they're still important for research. They give us a lot of information. But the bottom line that I think we should take away from them right now is that um, we're nowhere close to herd immunity. So most of these uh, herd immunity would be something close to 60 or 70 percent. So we're clearly not there, even in areas that have been hard, hard hit. Um, and the other interesting thing that these zero studies are telling us is that there's probably approximately 10 infections for every confirmed case. And those are, that's pretty consistent across all of the zero studies that have been published. So we still need more data. We need bigger zero studies um, that are more carefully designed. There are two key features of an antibody test. Uh, one is sensitivity and the other is specificity. The test has to be sensitive enough not to miss antibodies if they're actually present, but specific enough not to accidentally show a positive result. So for patients who want to do this antibody testing, you wanna be able to answer the question, if I test positive, um, does it mean that I actually have antibodies? And so it sounds counterintuitive, but the answer to this question depends on how many people in the community have had COVID. Um, there's an epidemiological principle that tells us the lower the prevalence of disease in a population, the greater the chance of a screening test giving a false positive result, which is really problematic for a number of different reasons, giving someone a false sense of, false sense of security um, being one of them. So, uh, you can see from this figure that if only 1% to 2% of the population of Arizona um, has had COVID, which we think is kind of in the ballpark, um, then there's a 50% chance that this antibody test will give a false positive reading, even if it's a highly accurate test, assuming 99% sensitivity and specificity. Next. So we also wanted to collect some social science data in the state of Arizona. And I don't have time to go into details of this survey today, but a few of the interesting findings that I think are worth sharing is that um, one, generally there is widespread support for the stay at home measures. And this support has not really waned throughout the course of our um, shelter in place order. Uh, we also seem to be seeing high levels of trust in local public health officials, um, which is good news because the more trust that you have in public health officials, the more likely the public is to follow the, their um, health advice. Um, and then the one other point is that there seems to be a interesting mismatch between what the public perceives is driving policy decisions, or excuse me, driving decisions around COVID. And the public perceives that these decisions are made based on political and economic reasons. But if you ask what they think should be driving 
uh, these decisions, it's overwhelmingly science. So there's an interesting mismatch there. And the link to the survey is on the bottom of the slides. So it's still open. Please uh, take the survey and share it with your friends. So just to wrap up, um, what we have so far from an epi perspective is that when people are most infectious, they may have no symptoms. Um, when they're most infectious, the tests are also often negative. Up to 40% of transmission may happen in a pre-symptomatic state. Testing is most accurate on the third day of symptoms. Some people with mild or symptom-free infections may have low level of, of antibodies. And most transmission appears to be caused by close contact with a symptomatic case. Um, and then finally, social disparities are driving who gets sick and who dies. Um, and then the next slide, please. So the good news is for all of, uh, all of the academics on the call today, that there is no shortage of work and research that needs to be done. Um, many, many critical details of the epidemiology of COVID are still unknown including the absolute number of cases, the role of kids in transmission, the role of pre-symptomatic transmission, um, even the risk of death when you're in the hospital. So we need a clear understanding of where people are getting infected, how this is changing over time. Uh, we also need to better understand the settings where transmission is occurring. So hospitals, subways, meatpacking plants, nursing homes, um, these likely do not have the same risks. And so we can better understand um, these locations, then we can, uh, we can use things like contact tracing and serial surveys um, with universal PCR at a particular venue um, to help us narrow in on better prevention strategies. Um, if we find out that general community transmission is high and disease is wide, widespread, um, then we might take different prevention strategies um, that are less targeted. And so uh, finally, we need a better understanding of the antibody tests. So what level is adequate to confer immunity? And under what conditions do people develop that adequate level? All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, um, Heather Ross. Great, thank you, Megan. And I appreciate the opportunity to learn uh, even more about where we are with epidemiology. It's changing every day. And uh, for everybody listening, uh, Megan and I are in conversations in our working group um, multiple times a day, and I still get to always learn something new. So thank you. Um, okay, can we have the next slide, please? And the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about policy. And um, it is as much as there's uncertainty in a lot of the epidemiology that we heard a lot of questions to answer, there's tremendous uncertainty around policy. Now policy making, of course, happens absolutely at the human level. And policy making in the COVID-19 pandemic emergency uh, is really, really interesting because it needs to marry the biological features of this virus and the, with the epidemiology that relies very much on human behavior with the politics and policy making decisions that also rely on human behavior. And humans, as you can imagine, are not always that easy to predict. So we start with our policy making around, you know, what happens next? Um, how is America going to reopen? By looking at the criteria for reopening. Now, this is a screenshot directly from the White House's guideline for opening up America again. And you can see when we look at it that there's these gating criteria that we need to meet along symptoms, cases, and hospitals. And when we look really carefully into the criteria, what does it mean 
um, with symptoms and who's tracking that, the influenza-like illnesses and the COVID-like illnesses or the COVID-like syndromic cases. And that's coming forward. It's been, it's a little bit of a squidgy set of criteria to report, but the healthcare system has been um, making that uh, reporting a priority and we're seeing that reflected now in ADHS uh, data that are presented on uh, the dashboard every day. I'm going to skip to the right hand side and say um, to look at the hospitals and as Megan mentioned we uh, have plenty of hospital capacity uh, in Arizona which is great we're not even close to maxing out our hospital beds so that's wonderful um, treating all patients without crisis care yes we're there and also having a robust testing program for at-risk health care workers including with emergency antibody testing and Megan talked about that coming back to the middle then the cases. So the, the criteria for cases are a downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14-day period or a downward trajectory of positive tests as a percentage of total tests within a 14-day period with a flat or increasing volume of tests. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. There are hundreds of ways to potentially interpret those criteria. When you look at downward trajectory of documented cases, what does that mean when you're ramping up testing in your state? As Megan mentioned, our case in Arizona is we have the rock bottom testing in all of the United States, we're 51 out of 51 when we include the District of Columbia. So yes, we are going to be seeing increases in documented cases as we increase our testing capacity. And so that then points us to, okay, maybe we need to look at the OR here, this downward trajectory of positive tests is a percent of total tests within the 14-day period with a flat or increasing volume of tests okay, but who's getting tests? And this is something Megan mentioned as well. Who's able to access these services? The communities that have been historically maybe disenfranchised or less well-connected to healthcare services may be similarly, and we're seeing this bear out on the ground, disconnected from testing. So can we have the next slide, please? So how to interpret? Yes, this is the case counts. If we look at, and this is a screenshot um, from yesterday, the uh, ADHS, you can find it at azdhs.gov. Um, there's a dashboard that's pretty robust, and this is the COVID-19 cases uh, listed or shown by day. And you can see that if you just look at the data that are being presented, now it's here are the things that are important to know about these data. Uh, the, the bars, every bar represents a day, and every case is tagged back to the date that the swab was taken. So when you look at the data, it always says there's a, um, and you can see the asterisk and the tiny little print on the bottom, that illnesses in the last four to seven days may not be reported yet, and that's because it is taking many days to report the data to get the test result back to the patient and also to get it uploaded into the state system. So there's always a lag. We can't look at the most, really frankly, at this time, we can't look at the most recent seven days to take any meaningful uh, indication from that because we just don't know what it is yet. Although we do know that if anything, the numbers in the last four to seven days are going to go up. So when we look at these case counts for Arizona, I don't see a declining trend at all. I see, if anything, an increasing trend. So let's go to the next slide. And now here's the testing volume and percentage. So this is a super busy slide. It again is a screenshot directly from azdhs.gov because I wanted you to see exactly the data that the state is presenting. Um, this was from yesterday. So it talks about the number of tests completed in total, all of the tests that were reported yesterday. That doesn't mean they were taken yesterday. It means they were reported yesterday. And that ties pretty well to the 
Saturday, May 2nd testing blitz that the state was running. Um, note that it is uh, filtered to all types of tests, including both the PCR tests showing active virus and the zero tests showing antibodies. So yesterday the state reported um, just shy of 7,500 tests and is reporting a combined total percentage of 7.6% um, for all COVID tests since we started doing this testing. If we look down, uh, and you can see then the very middle section shows all tests by the date of collection. Important things to notice about this graph, and this is where we should all be really, really thankful to our elementary and junior high school teachers who taught us to be really scrupulous when we look at, uh, at graph and, and chart data. I'm gonna call your attention to the y-axis where you'll notice the y-axis in equally spaced increments goes from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. So it's a convenient way to represent um, really widely varying raw numbers, but just note that this should not be taken as any kind of like even increment. And that way it's a log scale. Okay, so all tests by data collection, and you can see that that has been trending up recently. Okay, um, we're gonna now look at the bottom rows that shows the percentage positive of the PCR tests, 8.1% um, overall, and it shows, um, as we go, it shows week by week, and you can see the gray bar indicates the number of tests delivered and then the dot, the red dot indicates the, um, the percentage of those that were positive. And you can see that again, um, it, it is trending down. Now here's the policy piece that fits into that. Important things to know are that in the last two weeks, the state broadened the recommendations for, or the guidelines for who can receive a test, who can get a PCR test. It used to be that you had to be showing active symptoms of this virus. And a couple of weeks ago, the state expanded that to say showing active symptoms of the virus, or if you think you have been exposed to someone with active COVID-19, you can also get a test. So, that expanded criteria coupled with the higher volume of tests, you have to ask yourself, are the percentages from the last two weeks, should we interpret them the same as the percentages from the weeks previously when our denominator, who we're testing, may be quite a bit different. The other thing that I want to point out is that there is not even equal equitable distribution of testing resources across our state or even across our metropolitan area here in Maricopa County, um, which is to say that we see data from people who can access testing, but we don't see people data from people who cannot access testing. And historically, and presently, people who cannot access healthcare services also are not accessing testing. And those are the people who may have a harder time sheltering in place at home. They are less likely to have jobs where they can zoom in via video calls all day. They are more likely to be the people who have to work out in the community in, uh, in an exposed way in order to support their families. Um, so the next slide, please. So what are our policy options at this point? Because we don't have a vaccine, we're working with what we call NPIs or non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we've seen business restrictions and closures, we've seen masking, we've seen stay at home orders, and we've seen shelter in place orders in different places around the country. Um, we have seen uh, them, we've seen these ideas, these uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions being taken up in different ways around different parts of the state. And we are, 
today seeing um, a relax relaxation in a lot of business restrictions. And we're going to see that again on Monday. And that's with uh, barbers and salons today uh, in particular, also reopening um, in-store retail today, as well as on Monday, we're going to see uh, restaurants reopening for dining services. Um, in a variety of places, we've seen masking orders, universal masking orders. We're seeing a lot of suggestions. Um, we're currently under a stay at home uh, executive order from the governor in Arizona until May 15th. Um, although the reopening of non-essential businesses um, may, should make us uh, question what does it mean to have a stay at home order or suggestion. Some places, um, uh, New York um, has shelter in place at this time. Um, we also have seen shelter in place uh, uh, policies and uh, curfew policies in uh, the Navajo Nation, which as Megan indicated, is uh, one of the hot spots not only in America, but uh, in the world. And next slide, please. So policy considerations, and that just to reiterate some, uh, all of the uh, things that we've said about testing availability, who can get tests and who cannot get tests is something we really have to consider. The answer, um, uh, the health equity answer is everyone should be able to get tests, by the way. Um, we also have some uh, real questions about the public health workforce, and my colleague Mike is going to talk about that in a few moments. Um, questions around data-driven policy. Um, we've seen some real questions about that arising in this past week in the local and national news. The other sets of questions around policy jurisdiction. And when, um, back in mid-March, when we were talking about doing bar and restaurant closures that uh, and also salons and gyms and things like this here in Arizona we saw some contention between municipalities and state over wh where the policy jurisdiction is uh, legal so the next slide please and uh, I, to, to close this section out uh, with a quote from Mark Lipsitch uh, at Harvard, for the short term, there's no choice but to use the time we're buying with social distancing to mobilize a massive political, economic, and societal effort to find new ways to cope with this virus. So I think we'll leave the policy stuff there because it's super messy and that's mm -hmm. where I like to be. Um, and I'll hand it forward to my colleague, Mike Schaefer. Mike, you wanna unmute yourself? I sure do. <laughs> um, Mike, I think you're muted again. If I can get through the technology, we'll be okay. My apologies. Um, and again, a great transition uh, slide that sets us up for a discussion around contact tracing. Next slide, please. Just the other day, we saw released by the Association of State uh, and Territorial Health Officers in conjunctions with Johns Hopkins University, a national plan uh, around reopening. And that national plan identifies three critical issues that we've got to build in here as we go forward. Ready access to the rapid diagnostic test and serological testing that Megan and Heather had referred to, but also um, tracing all contact, isolating the sick, and then quarantining those individuals who are exposed. Next slide, please. And this is a great quote that comes from that Ashto Johns Hopkins report. Public health agencies are now being asked to do something that has never been done at the scale that's going to be required in the United States if we're going to successfully manage this pandemic. Find every COVID-19 case in the midst of this national epidemic with the widespread community transmission already occurring and then work quickly to spread through intensive um, case and contact tracing interventions. Next slide, please. So we define contact tracing as this process of identifying, assessing, 
and managing people or contacts who have been exposed uh, to uh, a disease to prevent uh, additional transmission. And while we'll hear a lot of talk about the aspects of identifying and assessing, the real challenge is going to be around managing of people to do things that they're um, oftentimes going to be, as we'll see, uh, unwilling or resistant to do. Next slide, please. The practice of contact tracing is an established long-term uh, element of community and public health practice in managing outbreaks of HIV and AIDS in our country and throughout the world, uh, in the management of uh, tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis testing, and uh, more recently in the area of Ebola. There is a uh, emergent methodology already in place here of how we do uh, contact tracing. Again, as the Ashto Johns Hopkins document points to us, it is the scalability with which uh, is breathtaking at this moment. Next slide, please. Uh, and so if you access the CDC's website, they just posted last week some nice information on contact tracing guidelines. Uh, they identify these four critical uh, elements to how we operationalize this practice of contact tracing. Trace and monitor contacts. Um, uh, Megan did a great job of laying out how long and how many uh, folks we have to trace and for how long we want to monitor. Um, we need to support the quarantine of contacts, asking people to stay home for 14 days may be easy for a segment of our population, but as Dr. Ross has um, emphasized in her comments, it will be that segment of our population that can't afford uh, staying home and quarantining for 14 days for a variety of reasons, either due to their living situation, to their work situation, uh, etc. Providing both the personal and the structural and financial support of quarantine is going to be one of the greater issues and challenges uh, in managing this epidemic. The scalability issue leads us to our uh, third guideline by CDC here is expanding that staffing resource and recognizing um, the um, capacity that has largely been gutted over the last 20 years by um, cuts to our public health and community health uh, budget uh, and resources. So we find a public health network in our country um, that uh, strained in responding uh, to previous smaller scale uh, epidemics um, in the last five to 10 years. Responding at this level of scale will take um, a Herculean effort on uh, the part of many of us. And then lastly, um, the smart use of digital uh, tools to aid and abet that contact tracing methodology. Next slide, please. And so if we look at contact tracing and the use of digital tracing tools and devices, um, all you have to do is go to Google and find that there's already a variety of different downloadable apps that one can um, um, make use of uh, that provides anonymous linking uh, communications. And again, uh, hats off to folks at Johns Hopkins and NYSH uh, review of uh, the mobile health app technology at the state. Um, but when we look around the country and look around the world and we look at the success that other countries such as Singapore and South Korea uh, have had in containing um, uh, the virus and implementing contact tracing, um, a lot of intrusion into personal liberties that we hold near and dear here in the United States is really going to, <coughs> if you will, challenge us in uh, the robustness with which these kinds of tracing tools get incorporated uh, into our response. And as the next slide will uh, indicate recent uh, polling data by the um, Kaiser um, uh, Family Fund uh, found that there's, next slide please, that there's a, uh, a fair amount of resistance from the general public in downloading these kinds of apps if they're indeed providing 
um, uh, protected health information back to uh, public health uh, officials. I would encourage you to take a look at the uh, tracking poll here from Kaiser if you're interested in this, because we, we dig a little bit deeper into the um, options, if you will, of how we sell a digital app contact tracing. These numbers begin to mitigate, uh, alter a little bit as we alter um, the purpose of uh, that. And fortunately, I don't think that additional data slide made it into our slide deck. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Yeah, that's what I suspected. This is simply a repeat on this slide. But again, I think as we think about contact tracing um, in a digital format, we've got to recognize there's going to be some uh, significant HIPAA uh, barriers. We're going to need to be very, very sensitive to, uh, along with a whole lot of other uh, personal liberty issues. Some nice work that was published back in February in The Lancet uh, on various feasibility scenarios of being able to control this outbreak through the use of case isolation and contact methods. Next slide, please. Um, and, uh, you know, the takeaway messages here is that case isolation and contact tracing alone uh, is going to be insufficient to control this outbreak, particularly this late in um, to um, um, this explosion. These authors though, do go on to point out that effective contact tracing and isolation could re contribute to reducing um, the size of the outbreak and bringing it under control uh, over a longer period of time. Next slide, please. So when we think about the human element of contact tracing, the direct act of public intervention, of uh, reaching out to and engaging with individuals who've been exposed to the virus, what we see emergent here are three different kinds of uh, roles. Individuals as contact tracers who are largely on the telephone, interfacing through a computer uh, database uh, and tracking down positive test cases and then all of the contacts that those positive test cases uh, are willing to uh, identify. These contact tracers need to be able to respond to individuals who are finding out at a, uh, they're intersecting with these individuals at a very precious, if you will, critical time. An individual being informed that they are infected with the COVID-19 um, uh, virus is likely to elicit a lot of fear uh, and anxiety. Um, being able to be empathic uh, and responsive to those fears, and then asking individuals to think through everyone that they've had 30 minutes or more of contact with for the last two weeks and give that contact tracer that individual's name, their address, their telephone number, their email address. Our contact tracing function has, uh, has got to elicit behavior uh, from a lot of individuals that they might not be typically willing to engage in. We see case investigators who supervise a small team of contact tracers using um, case management uh, methodology and case flow management uh, to monitor this moving cohort of individuals that have to be monitored uh, over a prescribed period of time. The case investigators also doing the investigative work in tracking down the non-respondents, those individuals who are non-responsive to the contact tracers, and those individuals who are not adherent, not responding to monitoring check-ins, violating quarantining uh, uh, requests, et cetera. Um, last, but uh, probably equally important as any other function here is what we might identify as care resource coordinators people who are able to connect individuals with instrumental uh, financial and structural resources at the community level. How to arrange for food boxes to be provided to an individual. How to secure um, immediate short-term housing for those individuals who are unable due to their living situation to quarantine um, and isolate in place. Um, so we see these three different kinds of personnel 
functions, human resource functions, interplaying in the establishment of effective contact tracing uh, procedures. Next slide, please. So how many tracers will uh, Arizona need? Our own uh, modeling team had run that I think Heather and uh, Dr. Lant had uh, led some initial uh, background napkin, if you will, um, um, uh, calculations on what those numbers will be uh, looking like. These are data uh, just recently uh, uh, put forth by folks at George Washington University, again in conjunction um, with um, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers, estimating um, that upwards of 1,800 contact tracers in total, taking into account those three different functions will be needed uh, in Arizona. I've provided the hyperlink here on the slide. I'd encourage people to um, uh, explore uh, the assumptions and some of the data background um, that uh, the folks at Washington and Asheville put together here. But it does provide some nice county level uh, information as well. Um, it, I want to turn attention to then maybe where do we go next um, in responding to this. And so um, uh, I offer up with my colleagues, Dr. Ross and Dr. Jen, um, some um, perhaps uh, beginning points for Q&A and uh, discussion. Um, so first of all, how do we move toward uh, establishing a contact rate uh, research agenda, um, both in terms of better unpacking, if you will, process and outcomes associated um, with contact tracing, uh, and the potential of comparing additive and summative effects of both um, the human resource element of contact tracing and the digital elements that we see uh, here beginning some discussion around what does contact tracing program fidelity and integrity uh, look like. We heard in Sonny Ashto uh, call um, effective contact tracing. Defining what effective is and being able to, if you will, capture variations toward uh, effective uh, is going to be some of the important formative research that's going forward. Um, the issues of how um, contact tracing is effective in, I'm sorry, next slide, uh, Marcus. Um, uh, uh, how we bring about contact tracing in vulnerable populations and communities. What would contact tracing look like among the Nede uh, uh, in uh, the Navajo community? Next slide. There's also an emergent implementation agenda uh, occurring here. The linkage between where the test results go and where contact tracing begins is the great important link that we don't have a good answer for yet. And neither the state nor the communities have really come to grips with how that linkage will occur. But we know the most important uh, element in driving effectiveness and contact tracing is the time lag between somebody knowing they've got COVID and starting the contact tracing program. A lot of what our team talks about is again these last mile of services of contact tracing, those wraparound support services that will help manage and support quarantine. And to our last slide then, toward an agenda of developing our workforce. We've got to be responsive right now to the very immediate needs that we see communities and systems that are standing up uh, workforce capacity in this area right now, um, um, but also look strategically longer term at what are the academic and service learning opportunities for our students in an interprofessional uh, and transdisciplinary uh, focus. Um, and I think that brings us to our last slide, which is our uh, Q&A and discussion. Heather, Megan. Well, thank you all so much. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, so one of our first question is, what is the probability that ASU becomes a super cluster in the fall if we open up the residential halls and start face-to-face -face teaching? Well, Megan, you're the epidemiologist in the house. Oh boy. I, <laughs> this is a hard, hard question to answer. 
um, you know, so much of the spread of, of COVID and SARS-CoV-2 is really dependent on human behavior. And so it's, those are the things that are really difficult to predict and, and to model, right? So if everyone can reduce their contacts by, you know, 50%, 75%, um, we can have a significant impact in keeping the disease low. If we can get aggressive contact tracing systems up and running, that also will make a big difference. And so, you know, I hate to be the epidemiologist that says it depends, but uh, without knowing, um, you know, what, whether we're going to be able to aggressively implement all of the resources that we need in this state for testing um, and contact tracing, I think it's just going to make a huge impact on sort of what our projections say about the spread of disease. But, but there's, there's no question that college campuses are, are difficult, difficult places with dorms. And I know that the reopening committee is, is thinking really, really carefully about what this is going to look like in the fall. Sorry, Heather, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that um, we can also look to very early experience in March where there was um, a private university in the Midwest that made the decision to call students back to campus. And um, there was a pretty significant spread of COVID within that campus community. Now that um, was a, frankly very different time than we are looking at in August with regard to, as Megan says, uh, testing capacity, contact tracing capability, et cetera. I think though that we can be very comfortable definitively saying that the risk is greater than zero. But that's about all we can definitively say. Thank you. When considering the denominator, is it possible to look at those who are now being tested to assess what percentage would have met the old criterion in order to look at that old denominator as well? Yeah, and we're um, actively working um, working on this with our with our modeling group. So the the state, um, they I think they gave a presser where they actually combined um, the PCR data and the serology data into the denominator for all testing. Um, most epidemiologists would argue that those are two fundamentally very different tests and they say very different things and so we shouldn't lump them together. Um, so the state actually, um, to their credit, responded to that criticism and uh, as of yesterday, they separated the data back out and they're now reporting uh, PCR data and antibody test results separately. So yes, we can absolutely run those calculations. Um, our next question is, were the number of American Indian deaths reported in Megan's slides inclusive of all Navajo deaths, or did they exclude Navajo deaths that occurred in other states since Navajo Nation is in three states? Yeah, great question. Um, those came directly from the ADHS uh, dashboard, so those are only Arizona um, deaths. And I will also note that, that there is a significant amount of missing data um, for race and ethnicity on the state dashboard, about 30%. Uh, so I did some quick recalculations to sort of separate the missing data from the denominators before I ran those um, calculations. But yes, it only includes Arizona data. What data is being used to estimate that only one to 2% of the Arizona population have been or are infected when we do not have enough testing. It seems that we do not have enough information to really know the infection rate. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point that we haven't done a lot of serology, but the serology that we ha have done shows about a 3% positive rate. And my guess is that there is some response bias there and that the people who are seeking out the antibody tests are probably people who think that they may have been infected with COVID or they even had a PCR positive test in the past. Um, so we also have, um, we also have other, um, data from, um, from sort of other epidemiological modeling studies, studies that we can help to sort of infer that number. Well, thank you all so much. That is our time for today. For those attending, um, the slides and the video recording will be posted on the College of Health Solutions website in the upcoming weeks. Um, thank you all to our panelists for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a fantastic day and stay healthy.
Thank, Thank you. you very much.